Good afternoon, good morning, and a good evening. This is Joseph Trevisani from FX Solutions from rainy and cold New Jersey. Uh, welcome. I'm glad you're all here. Today's discussion will be, and I'd like this to be a discussion as we've tried before, so if you have any questions or any comments on any topic, please uh, just type it into the chat and I will answer them as they come along. I'm perfectly willing to, and I'd in fact like, to stop the discussion at any point you'd like. Um, for anyone who's not been here before, let me give you a little bit of my background so that you know what I know and what I probably don't know. Um, I spent 12 years as an interbank trader for Credit Suisse in New York and in Singapore, and two very non-stressful years as an interbank trader for the Bank of Bermuda in Bermuda. So I am very familiar with the interbank market, the way it works, the way it prices, and how prices are derived from the interbank market to the prices that you as retail traders see. Um, I've just given a presentation on uh, the way this market works um, for new retail traders. So please, if you have any questions based on that, even if it's aside from the topic, please let me know and I will do my best to answer them. Uh, the first question I see right here, and I'll answer it before we get into uh, today's discussion, which is about the green revolution question mark. I refuse to we'll use the term green, which is out there everywhere. It, it always amazes me how unoriginal journalists are, um, willing to just get the copy out, but at any rate, um, that the signs being exhibited by the economy uh, for recovery, I believe, are very, very tentative, and I also believe are in great danger of being squashed by what's going on potentially in the bond market. But at any rate, we'll deal with that in a minute. Um, the first question is, what are the leverage and time frame big banks are using in their FX trading? Um, good question, actually. Leverage isn't really a factor. Credit Bank trading desks work on credit, on credit lines and position size that are allowed the individual traders. Um, a bank's deal partners are determined by the credit lines. That means J.P. Morgan Chase has a credit line with Goldman, I mean a bank dealing line with Goldman of $2 billion. So they can do $2 billion worth of trades with Goldman in any day. Um, the leverage that you might consider from a trading point of view, or from a trader's point of view, is really the limits on position size for the individual traders. Um, when I was there, I was not supposed to have any position on greater than $50 million, um, or the equivalent of that in other currencies. Of course, uh, the way you look at that is that would be a held position. So, I mean, if I'm pricing someone in $300 million uh, Deutschmarks, then for the instant that the deal is completed, if it is, I would have a $300 million position to, like, cover the position. When they talk about uh, limits, they're really talking about positions that are held. So that's the way banks work. Um, they don't use leverage. They use credit lines. And... So they have a lot more leeway in their position. Now remember, bank traders are trying to do exactly the same thing you are. That's just make trading profit. Time frames. It depends on the type of desk. When I was trading, I was trading on a spot desk. Our job was really threefold. The first one was to make prices for the market. That means we had relationships with hundreds of banks around the world. And when they called me for prices, I had to make them a price. We had an agreement on what spread I would show, and they would have to make me in return. Um, so that time frame is extremely short. Um, if you dealt on, if, if Goldman uh, asked me for a price and came in and then dealt, I would almost always cover that position immediately. On the, I'll tell you the time frame right now. On the assumption that if Goldman is doing 20 or $30 million with me, they're doing $20, $30 million with 10 other banks, and the market's going to move, and Goldman is dangerous because Goldman has a big customer book. Um, so that's the kind of logic you would use. So most positions were held only as long as it took for you to cover them, and that is a matter of seconds. Prices were also open for a matter of seconds. If I made a price to a customer, my assistant who actually manipulated and put it into the Reuters terminal 
would hold it open for maybe three seconds and he would hit the interrupt button, the price was off. If the bank that I was talking to wanted another price, they would have to ask again. And they were not allowed in the, in, within the context of a relationship to ask more than two times. Um, the relationship was courtesy and it was competitive. So whatever I made for them, they would have to make for me. Now, you were also allowed as a trader to have overnight positions. And these positions sizes were much, much more limited than uh, the positions that you might have on during the day. In general, I never held an overnight position when I was trading um, for more than usually, it was always under $5 million. Um, that was my choice. I had a, a larger limit if I wanted to use it. But the type of trading that I did was basically um, flow trading. That means uh, my job was to make prices for the market based on the prices I were hearing from brokers. And if there was a good reason for me to go with a trade, that means if I had a customer that came into me and priced, wanted a price in 500 or 200 million uh, Deutschmarks, I made the price the customer dealt, then I would probably go with that trade for 20 million Deutschmarks or $20 million worth of Deutschmarks in the direction the trade was going. Uh, because my last job, of course, was to make money, was to make P&L. Uh, manipulate price. <laughs> no. In the sense that uh, if a customer has a certain amount to do and it gets executed in the market, then will that move the market? Yes, that's true. And there is no rule, regulation, or any other consideration uh, in the FX markets that makes it any different. Um, the FX market in this sense is very different than the exchange-based markets. The, and I don't want to spend too much time on this. I know, I know it's an interesting topic because for everyone, what they really want to know is what makes the market move day to day, minute to minute, second to second. Um, there are times where a large bank or a central bank will be able to move the market. But remember, um, once that pressure is off, the market will almost always resume its prior movements. Um, and yes, in that sense, the, please dispel, okay. Uh, let's deal with, let me deal with these two very quick and let me get on to my topic here because we, I, could, I could talk about back and forth about the way the market works and the differences easily for the entire 45 minutes, but then we'd have to skip the topic I have here. I'll be glad to answer some more questions about this at the end. Let me just dispel these two topics right here. The way the foreign exchange market works, um, it is a decentralized market. There is no one place to go. <laughs> I understand market, market workings are probably more important than anything else. I'll tell you the truth. Maybe the next time or the next topic that I do for FX Street, we will, I will do exactly that. I will explain all that I know and all the differences about the way the foreign exchange market works because I have seen it from both sides. I know why the... Um, Prices move the way they do in a market, in the FX market. One thing you must remember is that the market is not, is so large and so decentralized that everyone who is operating in the market, whether they're working for Deutsche Bank or Bank of Bermuda or George Soros when he takes time out from all of his political endeavors, um, is operating in very limited informational territory. You don't know what's out there in the market. You don't know what anyone else is about to do. All you can really do is react to movements. There are, on rare occasions, a bank will have enough of an order to actually move the market for a few pips. And that is true. And then everyone else in the market is at a disadvantage. And that includes you and me, retail traders, bank traders, everyone else. Because if I'm sitting on the Credit Suisse desk and I have 300 million Deutschmarks to go, no one else knows that. So the, it's, the same, it's going to have the same effect on Goldman when I call them for a price as it is for you watching the price movement. Um, but that is the way the foreign exchange market works. It is less of an organized market and far more of a cooperative market. 
In that, it's a much purer market because the only information you as a trader are working with is very limited. The price information for you is the same for everyone else in the market. If you're looking at price movements on your GTS system or whatever system you're using, and I'm sitting at the Credit Suisse desk or the Deutsche Bank desk or the Bank of Bermuda desk, or any other desk, I'm looking at the same information, the same exact type of information from the EBS and Reuters terminals. Um, the news that comes out hits everyone at the same time. Any developments hit everyone at the same time. So because of this decentralized status, in fact, for the participants in the market, it is a much more equal distribution of information. The only information that is not equal is any particular desk that has a particular order to look at. And that is it. So for that, I've always felt that the foreign exchange market is the purest market. But if I may, um, let us – listen, I'm gonna ha let me get through the, today's presentation. And um, manipulating price is not the correct terminology because manipulating involves a <laughs> manipulating involves a judgment. When um, a trader on a bank desk execute an, executes an order, his purpose is to execute the order. That's it. And don't forget, he takes an enormous risk because if he's selling and the market is buying, then that position is going to go directly in his face. He'll still execute the order for the customer but his proprietary position, his flow position that was based on that, will cost him a great deal of P&L. So it is very difficult for me to call it manipulating since manipulating implies success, that you will be able to move the market in the direction you want to whenever, you're, whenever you decide to do so. And having executed many, many orders and having been thrown all around the market by what's going on, I can assure you that that is absolutely not the case. When a trader on a bank desk starts executing an order, the risk factors go up enormously for his P&L and for the execution of the order. So it is most assuredly not a manipulation in the sense that anything is guaranteed. Um, I explained the time frames before. I'll do it again. But let, let me deal with today's topic. Um, I called uh, the presentation uh, green, the Green Revolution simply because I was uh, unwilling to use the term green shoots. That's the only term I'll use, and I put a question mark after it because the, it's my contention that the indicators that have improved are a result of two factors. The first is that after the enormous, unprecedented, end-of-world type declines we saw in the markets and almost all of the markets last year, any recovery is almost assured, meaning the markets cannot simply without the end of the world basically, or Armageddon, continue at those types of declines. And as soon as you have a lessening of the declines, that will immediately be called recovery, incipient recovery, green shoots, whatever you'd like. Um, for me, the indicators that have improved are largely, not exclusively, but largely sentiment indicators. They're where people, especially the consumer sentiment indicators, which have um, improved in some cases pretty substantially, just some numbers. Um, if you look at the University of Michigan uh, consumer confidence number, the overall number, uh, in September, it was last year, last year, what I'm trying to do is compare the levels we're at now to um, what we saw in some of these numbers before the great collapse uh, following the Lehman bankruptcy last year. Uh, the, in August of last year, the uh, University of Michigan overall cons consumer confidence number was 63. In September, the month of the collapse, it was 70.3. It then dropped down. Uh, these readings were down from the low 90s, which had been in the year before. 
when things were still going really well. This year it had, in May of this year, the most recent number, <laughs> I am not going, I promised Maud, actually I didn't promise Maud, I promised Maud, I told Maud that I might have some, uh, that the second part of my presentation will necessarily have some political um, commentary to it, it is unavoidable, um, so we'll just have to wait for that. Um, I'm not going to say anything more at the moment. Let, let me finish with the current thing because it leads to, to a place I'd like to go, actually. Um, so the numbers in, in, 70, in uh, September was 70.3. This is the overall number. Um, these, uh, in May of this year, it had recovered to 68.1, and it had gone down into the low 50s uh, post-collapse. This 70.3 number is the highest um, since last September, and it's also an enormous jump in that month. I think it was like a 20-point jump in that month. Okay, that is a confidence number. That's when people come to your door and they say, how do you feel about the economy? Okay, uh, what do you think is happening in the economy? What people, it's always been my contention that what people tend to do in a situation like this, since most of us are not economists, including myself, is that we relate back to the interviewer uh, what we gather from the media, um, what we gather from our reading. Now, this is not true of everyone, and it's not true in some absolute degree at all. Any survey is not simply a reflection of what people hear. But I do feel that especially in our world, and this is a theme that I know I've hit on a number of times before, that in our 24-hour news cycle world, we can all thank Ted Turner for that, um, although I'm sure it would have happened anyway, and CNBC and all of the other outlets, that, the, that a particular story, a particular line, a particular scenario, becomes much more prevalent in the perception of both the market and people who are paying attention simply because they hear it all the time. Um, and as I've said, I talk to many journalists, and what they generally do is they look for a cause and effect. And if the cause and effect works, they tend to get the same cause and effect from everybody. So one particular storyline gets repeated. Uh, the current conditions line also um, has improved, but well, let's do the expectations. The expectations, this is the University of Michigan survey. The expectations of the survey was, six, uh, six, the expectations section of the survey was 67.2 last September. It went down to just over 50 this past February, and it came back to 69.4, a little bit above uh, where it was in September in May. Again, uh, the same type of recovery. The current conditions, and this is one of the things that I find uh, interesting, and the current conditions, which is a much more uh, personal and focused question. Um, it says, well, what are your conditions like? What are you seeing? What is your family doing? Um, that reading was uh, 71 in August of last year, 75, believe it or not, went up in September, the month of the crash, and then went to uh, the beginning of the crash, anyway, and then went to a low of 57.5 in November, and in April it was up to 68.3 this year, but in May it actually dropped, 67.7. We can look at the other major confidence number in the United States. Um, I was actually going to do a similar type of comparison for, the Europe, and the, for Europe and the UK. Uh, the problem was the uh, webinar one would have been really boring because I've just been reading statistics, and two would have lasted for two hours, which I don't think anyone is willing to sit through, including me. So let's look at the next one. Consumer, the conference board numbers. The overall number was 58.5 last August, 61.4 in September, and last month, 54.9. The expectations component, again, looking forward, what are you hearing from the economy, was 54.1 last August, 61.5 in September, 51 in April, and this is a rather astonishing jump, 72.3 in May. Now, these numbers are usually not revised dramatically. They're not like some of the statistical, some of the economic statistics numbers. But that is a rather astonishing jump, 51 in April to 72.3 in May. Do prospects in the world suddenly look all that much better? I would say no. So I would sort of question, sometimes you do get outriders in these, outliers in these surveys. Um, and we have the current conditions. It was 
65 in August, 61 in September last year. Went down to 22 this past March. And where's the number? And this year in May, it had recovered only to 28.5. So the lowest and the least recovered numbers in both of these surveys are the current conditions numbers. And this is a disparity or a discrepancy or a dichotomy, a lot of Ds there, um, which we've noted before, where the current conditions, and this is both not just on the bad side, but on the good side as well. Last year, um, before the great crash, these numbers were re registering almost exactly the opposite type of split. The expectations numbers, the overall number, Last year, with the year and a half at that point, or year's worth of coverage of the credit crisis, the subprime crisis, the Bear Stearns bank, uh, the Bear Stearns buyout in March. So after March, you were getting some very declining numbers in the expectations category and in the overall number. But you were still getting a very positive reading in a lot of the current conditions. People were obviously saying the opposite of what they're saying now. They were saying, well, you know, what we hear from the economy is things are terrible, but I've still got my job. My house really hasn't crashed that much, and things are still looking pretty good for my family's finances. Um, you're hearing exactly the opposite now. Uh, for the past month or two months, uh, well, things are improving a little bit. The jobs are not quite as bad. Um, the Fed's been lowering rates, on and on and on. So yeah, maybe things are getting a little better in the general economy. My own personal situation, no way. I'm worried. Uh, I've, if I haven't lost my job, I know people have lost their jobs. I'm cutting back. So you get this kind of split in these numbers, which is why I have uh, taken to valuing them less than I used to as far as indicators, especially forward-looking indicators for the economy. Um, so what you get, of course, in the overall number is, remember, the overall number is a combination of the subcategories. You get the overall number, especially in something like the conference board where you have that dramatic, or, or in the university, or is it the conference board? Hold on. It was the conference board where you have that um, expectations component driving up from 51 in April to 72.3 in May. You get the overall number being supported and being um, driven higher by that expectations um, component. Um, so again, it, for me, that gives a little bit of a distorted view of, of what's actually going on in the world. Uh, you have a similar type of um, result from the ISM, the Institute for Supply Management. Um, this is also considered a forward-looking sentiment indicator. However, it's a business sentiment, not a consumer sentiment number. And you get some of the same same readers here. I'll just go through them quickly. Uh, the manufacturing survey, the ISM splits its uh, survey between the manufacturing sector and the service sector. Of course, the manufacturing sector is tiny in this country these days. And it's about to get even smaller. Um, the services is the, is the largest part of the economy. But um, two things happen with the manufacturing survey. One, we used to have a much larger portion of the uh, economy being done uh, uh, Sorry, manufacturing used to comprise a much larger portion of the economy. Um, so you have some tradition attached to that. And there are many economists who feel, although I don't really agree with them, that the manufacturing survey is more indicative of uh, future movements than the services sector. I have a hard time understanding that would, why that would be true if the manufacturing sector is 15 or 20 percent of the economy and the service sector is 70 or 75 percent. However, be that as it may, the manufacturing survey registered 49.9 um, just of, under the 50 expansion contraction line last August, 43.4 in September, and by May of this year it had, quote, recovered to 42.8. Well, if you recover from the mid-30s, which is where it was in February and March, but your recovery is still 42.8, you are still in a major recession. Uh, yes, it's on the same slide because the slides that I have are relating to the second section of my presentation, um, which I hope I have a chance to get to. 
um, and it relates to why the green shoots scenario, even though it is less uh, green than I think the market um, believes, um, and why I don't think it will even manage to do that. Uh, but that'll, that'll take that in a few minutes. Um, that was a question from Maud, Gils Maud Gilson, the administrator. Apparently, she got a little bored looking at one chart. Um, so again, if you had a number in the manufacturing survey of 42.8, and you were looking at that in any other situation, you would say, we are in a pretty serious recession. It is now being spoken of as a recovery. Um, I have a hard time with that. Now, logically, of course, if you go down to 30 and you need to get back to 50 before you're in expansion, at some point along the way, you're going to pass through 42.8. So in that sense, it is a recovery, of course, but it is a recovery only in that sense. At no point do we see that this is actually representative of an expanding economy. Uh, the new orders category, which I sort of take as a... Uh, as a comparison to the uh, expectations categories, um, uh, was the most buoyant of the manufacturing uh, component. It was 51.1 in May, and that is above the 48.2 reading of last August and the sub-30 low of last November. Um, that does record new orders coming in, and that is a real number. So it does show certainly some growth and even expansion. We will see if that number relates to the, uh, is changed on revision. But even so, one caveat I would certainly put on that is the size of the manufacturing sector in the United States economy. Um, it is small. That was my cell phone. I apologize for that. I'm going to turn it off. Um, which is relatively small relating to the overall economy and not something that I feel is really indicative of what is going on in the economy. Nevertheless, we can take that as it may that there may actually be some sort of growth there. Uh, when we look at the non-manufacturing, the services sector, we have a similar, although less, excuse me, robust recovery. Well, let's look at that. The non-manufacturing survey was, um, that's the services sector, was 50.4 in the month before the crash. It had um, pretty steadily in the period leading up to um, last fall been at a higher rate, um, at a higher reading than the manufacturing survey. Um, one of the things that could certainly be true about the new orders in the manufacturing survey is that there has been a tremendous rundown in inventories. Now, when you run down your inventories, even without sales, you will be likely to start rebuilding them to some degree. So although the new orders number in the manufacturing survey was above 50, it's debatable whether that is sustainable unless you get a recovery in the consumer sector. After all, if you're ordering goods to restock your inventory to some degree, if somebody doesn't buy those goods, then you stop restocking your inventory and start running it down again. So in the end, beyond you know a two or three month period, the manufacturing orders depends on the health and the purchasing of the consumer economy. Um, so non-manufacturing survey, as I said, was 50.4 uh, the month before the crash, 50 in September went down to, this is the overall composite, went down to 37.4 last November and made it back to 44 again. Same type of comment, so I won't go through it again, as for the manufacturing survey. The new orders number in manufacturing, in non-manufacturing, was 49.5 in August last year, 50.6 in September, went down to 35.6 in November, and had bounced at this point to a still contracting level of 44.4 in May. This is quite a difference than the reading we're seeing in the manufacturing survey where it burnt, where the new orders went up to 51.1. Um, I'm not a very experienced statistician, but 
it would be my contention that the non-manufacturing survey is probably a better indicator of what's actually going on in the consumer economy, which means the future than the manufacturing survey for some of the reasons I have spoken about. Now, these sentiment numbers um, have not translated really in any concrete sense, or any, in any real sense either, to increases in consumer spending or industrial activity. Um, as I said earlier, it's sort of like everyone is saying, yeah, you know, things are probably getting better. The, uh, the world didn't end. Uh, Goldman didn't go bankrupt. I can still go to my bank. Chase is still there. Things have got to be a little bit better. But, and we'll go through some of the statistics on this, I myself am not spending. I am worried about my job, and many people are. Um, and I'm going to adjust my consuming habits, which basically is the economy, with that view. So let's look at some of the facts, that, the uh, statistics that I actually look at when I'm trying to figure out what's, what's happening with the consumer economy. As I said, I have been focusing much, much more, especially over the past two years, on actual number rather than sentiment numbers. Yes, um, someone has a comment about, I guess you all see it, about consumer debt. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak about that, actually. Not about the ratio, but about the absolute size. I'll talk about that in a minute. So the numbers I'm going to look at right now are consumer credit, personal expenditures, industrial production, and capital utilization. And they all remain pretty firmly in recessionary terms. Um, first one, consumer credit, which someone mentioned. I'm not, um, in September of last year, um, after a year and a half of house, housing declines, a year and a half of media coverage after the Bayer Stearns uh, collapse, nevertheless, the American consumer added $6.7 billion in debt to their portfolios. At that month, the three-month moving average for consumer credit was $3.4 billion. Uh, no. The reason I'm not moving the slides is because the slides uh, pertain to the second section. And um, I will real deal with that, and then I'll go through the slides. Um, so that's the reason the slides haven't moved so far, but if you'd like, I'll be glad to move the slide. That's the next one. Um, but I'm going to talk about the slides in a few minutes. Um, so, uh, where were we? Last September, the American um, consumers, on a three month average, added, in the prior three month moving average, added to $3.4 billion to their, I'm sorry, that was in August, they added, <clears throat> okay, let me check this again. Last September, I want to make sure I get the figures right. Last September, um, consumers added $7 billion in debt to their portfolios. In August of that year, the uh, three-month moving average had been an additional 3.4. In September, the month of the crash, nobody's internet is that slow anymore, I don't think. Um, in September, the month of the crash, American consumers still added almost $3 billion to their portfolios. In April, that was last year, after all of the house price declines, after all of the media coverage, after, as I said, the Bear Stearns um, collapse, nevertheless, Americans were still, in a real sense, adding to their debt. And that, of course, helped to keep the, yeah, I'm going to have to rush as usual. I think anybody who sits through my webinars has a sense that I have a tendency to run over. So I'm going to rush. Uh, so I, so I would like to get to what I have on the screen there. Um, and I think it's very apropos of what's going on. Um, and interesting, actually. Very interesting. Anyway, um, in, September, in April of this year, consumer credit contracted by $15.7 billion. In March, Americans had uh, subtracted $16.5 billion from their debt. The three-month moving averages in those months were 14.4 and 7.53. If the American consumer does not spend, and this you have heard over and over and over again, and contracting credit numbers tell you that the American consumer is saving and not spending, the money is going to pay off debt and not into spending, which is probably the only thing that could possibly happen in a situation like this. Nevertheless, it has a tremendous impact on the potential for the economy to grow. 
If you look at personal expenditures, the one from the uh, the one Fed, the one that uh, the Fed likes to look at, not the retail sales numbers, which I'll talk about briefly in a second, it has declined in six of the past eight months since last September. The only months that were positive were January and February of this year, when the tremendous discounts from the post Christmas sales boosted spending. What went down in the months before went up. There was really no net gain. In the eight months before September 2008, the ratio of spending was exactly the opposite, the ratio of positive months. There were six positive months and only two negative months. Um, it seems to me that we're not seeing any great reviving in consumer spending. Um, if you look at the productive economy, industrial production, um, that has had only one positive month since the beginning of last year, and that was October 2008. Compassion utilization is at 69.1%. It has dropped every month since December 2007. In fact, I'm not sure exactly what the number is, but I think that 69.1 number is about a 20-year low, although I'd have to check that on that. So when you look at the real numbers of the economy and the real spending of the consumers, you are not seeing the supposedly better sentiment indicators being reflected in reality. You can make the same discussion about today's retail sales numbers. In May, they were up 0.5%. The ex-auto number was up 0.5%. What is the key fact about retail sales, at least the statistic? It's a nominal number. It, uh, it includes price changes as the PCE number does not. Therefore, when you look at the X-Auto and X-Gasoline numbers without those two figures, you end up only up 0.1%. That is not a picture of a recovering economy. Now, I don't really want to make the case that this is going to be a permanent contraction in the economy. Of course not. But what we are looking at are degrees, and degrees are very, very important. And that brings us to our next topic right here. The amount of debt that the government is projecting on the world debt markets for the next 10 years is unprecedented. I mean, the term unprecedented is like green shoots, only it goes back much further. I mean, it's tremendously overused. Everything suddenly, when everyone wants to make a point, is unprecedented. And in fact, most things that are called unprecedented are most assuredly with precedent. But the budget deficits that are actually being planned by this current administration are without analog in the history of the world's credit markets and certainly in the history of this country. The key to what has happened has been their effect on the treasury market. Now, this are, uh, these are two charts of the Fed fund rate. The target rate, which has been at uh, 0.25, it's actually 0 to 0.25 since uh, last December, and the actual rate, that is the rate that's actually out there in the, over, in the market, in the overnight market, um, as affected by the Fed's uh, open market operations. The volatility of last fall, as you can see, clearly has uh, greatly diminished. This type of chart, the comparison, is actually pretty normal. Um, the Fed target rate, the 0.5, which is what the, what the media always talks about, is not a real rate. It is a target rate, and the Fed adjusts to that rate by its open market operations every day. This is the type of chart that you usually get, although it is a little bit more volatile than you might see normally. Um, it's still a reasonable approximation of a, of, a, of a more or less normal Fed funds rate. This, however, is the 10-year Treasury yield. Now, remember the Fed's purpose in keeping the, in attempting to keep the rates low. Um, without making any comparison to Japan's zero rate policy, which, uh, in my opinion, yes, in the bond market, yields are inverse to price. That's correct. Because what happens is the bonds are issued with a, with a specific rate on them. In order to adjust to market rates, the price has to be adjusted. So yes, when the bond prices go down, that means the rates, the yields on the bond are going up and in the reverse. 
So what you're looking at on the screen now is 10-year Treasury yield. If you're looking at a bond price chart, it would be exactly opposite. This big move right here, and it's on almost all the charts, so I've got them here. It's right here. This day right here. And also, well, let's go down further. Where is my rate chart? Oh, this one right here. This one right here is, no prize for guessing this, and it's right here as well, is March 18th. March 18th was the day the Fed announced that they were actually going to, at some point, be instituting a quantitative easing policy. Quantitative easing is a politically correct term for monetization of the debt. What happens, I'm sure you've all read this, but I think it's very crucial to what's going on, and it's crucial to the view that I am adopting of the dollar. And you all know that I've actually been for a long time a, uh, a, uh, a believer that given um, other things equal, and the, that means making the traditional types of economic comparisons, interest rates and economic growth, that the dollar will fare well over the next decade. That has always been my opinion. There is a new factor in that equation, and it is working hard to change my mind. I haven't quite gotten there yet, but I am looking at numbers, and, num and I'm looking at movements in the markets, and they're telling me things that are worrisome, and probably everyone else, too. I'm not the one, the only one doing this. At any rate, um, May 18, March 18th was the day the Fed announced they were going to do $300 billion quantitative easing. I said quantitative easing is monetization of the debt. That means the Treasury needs money. The Treasury issues bonds so it can get money from investors. But it doesn't want to pay a lot for the bonds, but the investors don't want them because if you look at the next two years, actually the next six months, and the next 10 years, you look at this chart right here, which is the projected size of the deficit versus GDP. You look at this chart, which is the deficit. That's the debt part. The prime one was this one is the debt. This one is the deficit. And this one is the projected deficits um, out here, one from the White House and one from the CBO. Um, and both of those, as historically, tend to underestimate, for obvious reasons, the actual um, deficits. They are unprecedented in their term. This increase in the deficit out here has to do with the entitlements and many other things in the United States. At any rate, when you look at that type of debt, and the Fed announced, and that was already known because the budget was already out. The Fed um, monetization of debt, their quantitative easing, um, takes the T-bills, notes, and bonds issued. Uh, I don't know exactly which ones they're buying. Um, from that the, that the Treasury issues. The Treasury issues a promissory note. Sells it to the, to the market. The market pays for the note. The Fed gets the, tre the, the Treasury gets the money and distributes it out to pay its bills. It sends it out into the economy. The money's created that it's getting already, though, because it's being given to it by private sources. When the Fed buys the debt, it creates the money. And it is absolutely a new phenomenon in American finances. And I think it is one which is very worrisome. What the Fed does is the Treasury issues it. The Fed sells The Fed buys it. The Fed gives the money to the Treasury so to speak. I think it just is some sort of you know, balance uh, transferred over on an account someplace. And what does the Fed to Treasury do with that money, which didn't exist before? Well, it uses it to pay its bills. It sends it out in the form of unemployment checks. It sends it out into the world. It increases the money supply tremendously. It monetizes the debt. The government creates new money to pay for its own debt. On one hand, the government issues. On the other hand, they create money. This is, I think, the major concern for the world. And it is the issue, more than anything else, that's behind these markets that you're looking at here, the dollar index, the euro dollar, which is basically the same thing, and the treasury yields. Um, they are all looking at the same problem. The problem is not that the Fed and the federal government could not 
take this back out of the economy so that it does not create all this extra money? The judgment is of the markets, at least preliminary right now, that they will not, not that they cannot, but that they will not. When you have the amount the size of the deficits that are projected by the U.S. federal government. It is difficult to come up with a good scenario politically that will let the government pay for all of this without, one, having higher interest rates or, two, raising taxes. Well, what happens if you have higher interest rates? Well, higher interest rates will most assuredly be a drag on the economy. They will be a drag immediately, and they're starting to be perhaps right now. The, and there is a caveat to this, as I'll mention in a minute. The 30-year uh, uh, mortgage has gone up a point in the past three weeks. Now, they were at, the, the mortgage rates were at historic lows. So as with the analysis on the ISM and the consumer numbers, that uh, just the reverse of it, when you start so low, and you go higher, yes, it's a recovery, but it doesn't mean it's positive. The same here. When, when things like the mortgage rates move up from historical lows, it doesn't mean that there is going to be a huge drag on the economy in normal situations. The problem is we're not in a normal situation. The reason the mortgage rates are at such historic lows is because they're being artificially pushed there because the government, the Fed, and the financial institutions are all concerned that there will not be enough growth, that deflation was looming, and that the vast increase in the money supply was necessary to prevent all that. So looking at a very weak economy, which we are, an economy where the government's own projections were, are based on what certainly appear to be now very unrealistic growth levels, this movement in the bond market is damaging to that scenario. And if the economy does not reach those growth levels, that also means tax. I'm being told there's five minutes left. Um, let me go through this. That also means that tax uh, revenues will fall far below where they're expected. It means the deficit will grow. Every growth in the deficit over the next 10 years is borrowed money. You are looking at a problem which has a tremendous ability to compound itself. Looking at the, uh, now, you know, 4% in a 10-year treasury is hardly an unusual historic rate. So in the context of that, it is not worrisome. However, in the context of the current situation, what the government is trying to do and what is happening in the markets, I do think it's worrisome. One other thing. The, one of the things that we've learned, um, and it's always one of those things that has to be relearned over and over and over again, is that what is crucial to almost any economy, certainly to a financial system, is confidence. All of those banks that were refusing to lend to each other last fall um, were worried. There was no realistic sense, that, especially those regional banks, that they weren't as solvent as they'd ever been, or close to it anyway, but everyone was worried. Confidence is what drives a financial system. Confidence is also what drives currencies. And if the market gets around to the idea that the U.S. government has no choice but to monetize its debt, even if it says something different all the time, then it will execute its own judgment on the dollar. And that, for me, is the greatest concern for the deficits. When you, there is no credible plan coming out of Washington. There isn't even a pretense at one to control the deficit. I'm not sure where they think this is going to come from. There are many smart people in the administration. But for me, it is a concern. Um, I will have to end here since we're at the time. Um, does, if anyone has any questions, I see one or two on the screen. I'll answer them. If anyone else has any other questions, please type them in. Um, 
you know, I did something with the, one of our IBs that, that maybe I'll talk to Maud about, and maybe people would, would be interested in this. I proposed a list of uh, potential. <laughs> I can't say that over the air, so I'm not going to. Um, a, a list of proposed questions, and maybe people can vote on what they would say. Um, question here Do they buy more gold reserves for all this uh, quantitative eating? No. We've moved long, far beyond the realm of. Um, real of uh, gold reserves, it isn't going to be returned. It would be impossible. It would also not permit the government to operate as it has. And so, as far as gold coming back as a reserve to any currency, um, I don't know. I believe in the tooth fairy before I believe in that. And I used to believe in the tooth fairy, so who knows? Maybe it'll come back. Um, there are very serious concerns. We are living through very interesting times. Um, of course, as I'm sure you all know, that is also a Chinese curse. May you live in interesting times. We will have to see what happens. Uh, we will continue this again next month. Um, perhaps we will let people choose on what they would like uh, for me to talk about. There is a good deal more to be said, and we will certainly have a great deal more information next month about the deficit, about American uh, budgetary problems and about what this means for the dollar. This was the title that went with this presentation, right there. And maybe we'll do that next month. Um, yes, I will. Uh, ah, Maud. Yes, I will most assuredly do one every month. Uh, thank you all very much for attending. I hope it was informative, um, and we'll do it again next month. Thanks again.